So what is environmental security and what does it have to do with government action on pollution and climate change? In this session, we will figure out all these answers with Natalie, with the title of Navigating Environmental Security in Arab World. Uh, for introducing me, Natalie, I can say that um, she's a 17 years old high school senior from Lebanon who participated her school's sub sub sustainability program, Numerius uh, Beach and underwater cleanups, and also efforts to pressure municip municipalities into banning single-use plastics during Lebanon's garbage crisis. It's your time to shine, Natalie. Thank you, Arya. Um, let me just turn my camera on. Can you see me? Yes, you're lovely. <laughs> okay, thank you. So I'm just going to share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. So um, hi everyone. Uh, like Arya said, my name is Natalie Ashad. I'm from Lebanon and I just turned 18 years old. I've been on the World Oceans the Youth Advisory Council for two years now. So I'm sad to be leaving, but it's been very fun for the past two years. I just graduated high school, or I'm going to be graduating in a few weeks, and I'm going to be starting university next year. And I'm planning on majoring in environmental science because it's something I'm very passionate about. And yeah, so the reason I chose to talk about environmental security in the Arab world is because I feel like the Arab world is very often overlooked or Arab countries are not really given a seat at the table when it comes to discussions about climate action and mitigation. And I feel like it's really important to take into consideration countries that are cons that are developing or that are considered turbulent because of lots of different conflicts. And I'm going to explore that within the context of environmental security. So first of all, um, this is where I'm from here on the map. Uh, Lebanon is a very small country in the Middle East. And if the Middle East is often overlooked, Lebanon is even more overlooked because of its very small size. Um, and I know that this might be a presentation filled with talk about conflict and poverty and war and things like that. So before I start, I'm going to go over an outline really quickly, just so that we're all on the same page about what we're going to be covering. So first, we're going to be talking about environmental security in general as a concept. I'm going to be defining it and giving examples. Then we're going to look at causal chains and what they are. And then I'm going to go over five case studies. I have five different Arab countries that I'm going to be exploring. Then I'm going to talk about my personal experience with environmental security and how I overcame um, the problems associated with that in my own country. And then finally, we're going to look at sustainability barriers and how those are different in developed versus developing countries and how we can overcome them in turbulent countries. So before we start, you can look at some baby turtles just to relax or de-stress, especially if you've been on this live stream for uh, many long hours. Okay, now I'm going to start. So first of all, the thing you need to understand about environmental security is that um, not everyone believes in it. There are lots of scientists, both political and physical, who don't believe in the concept of environmental security because they think that national security does not depend on the environment, or even if it does, the correlation is not strong enough for it to be um, like very strong. So like if a natural disaster is affecting um, a conflict or leading to it, those people think that it wasn't that strong of a correlation and it doesn't really have an effect on national security. But the theory of environmental security basically states that the environment is a key element of regional and national security. This means that you cannot have national security without taking into consideration the environment and the situation of nature in that country as a factor. So this includes consumption habits, like whether or not you're producing and consuming products sustainably. It includes ecosystem services, habitat restoration and preservation or degradation, climate change and global warming, and all of those different factors. So the theory of environmental security basically states that environmental issues are threat multipliers for national security concerns. What a threat multiplier is, 
is basically something that multiplies or increases the threat. So like if you have a war and a wildfire takes place, obviously here the wildfire is multiplying the threat. It's not making the situation any easier and it's making things much worse because it's complicating the issue and increasing the number of consequences or potential casualties. So that's why environmental issues are threat multipliers for national security concerns. And it works both ways. Like if you have a war, obviously um, environmental issues are going to become worse, whether it's indirectly through economic repression or directly through habitat um, destruction. So I'm going to look at both ways. The first way is the impact of conflict and national security concerns on the environment. And I have two examples here that are pretty broad and that everyone should be familiar with, or I don't know. Um, the first example is Europe during World War I. The artillery used by soldiers during World War I led to avalanches because people kept bombing the mountains and then eventually snow started falling and this led to a major avalanche. And I'm sure you've heard of White Friday, which took place during 1916 during World War I. There was a clash between the Allies and Austria-Hungary and the soldiers were firing lots of artillery at the mountain, which led to an avalanche and 270 soldiers were killed because of this. So here you can see that conflict had a major impact on the environment. And then also the environment had a major impact on the conflict because the avalanche killed soldiers. My second example is what took place during the Vietnam War. Um, American soldiers released 20 million gallons of Agent Orange, which is a very toxic pesticide onto Vietnamese forests. And as a result of this, um, there was lots of uh, forest destruction. And until today, it's very difficult for um, Vietnamese to plant in those areas because of the pesticides and because of the damage that it caused. So they can't plant their crops there anymore. And it also led to a lot of um, harm and lots of casualties. So here you can see how conflict and war is causing environmental destruction, both during with the artilleries and with the Agent Orange. Now let's look at it in the other direction. How can the environment contribute to national security and how can it affect it? So here I also have two examples. The first one is Syria. Um, and I'm going to, this is one of my case studies actually, so I'm going to be exploring it in more detail. So first of all, the drought in Syria contributed to the Syrian conflict. And here you can see, like, if you look at the sentence like that, you can see how it doesn't seem like the entire Syrian conflict took place because of a simple drought. And that's why some people deny the theory of environmental security, because they think that there's no way that a simple drought can cause so much damage and so, and so much tra tragedy. But it did contribute to it, and we're going to explore that more in the case study, because drought leads to more tensions, leads to migration movements and stuff like that, which all lead to more tension and eventually conflict. My second example is kind of a, a present one. It's not, it hasn't really taken place already, but it's in the process of doing so. This is in North and South Sudan and water shortages are causing lots of tension between them because they need to cut down trees to feed their camels because there isn't enough water to feed the camels. Um, and there's lots of tension and fighting over resources and stuff like that. So here you have two examples and both of them are actually in the Arab world and both of them are related to water. Um, which is a major, major problem in the Arab world because we don't have enough of it because um, we're in a really hot part of the world. So here you can see how um, national security um, concepts such as conflict or political tensions can damage the environment and then vice versa, how the environment is affecting national security. Um, and the way I describe these is very kind of, um, just verbally and not really on paper. And the way you can kind of quantify all these effects onto each other and put it into an organized way is through causal chains. A causal chain is a chain, it's a chain of events that shows how one thing is affecting the other and how the environment is basically affecting an issue of national security. So here I have a very general example, just so that you're kind of more familiar with causal chains before I get started. Um, if you have a natural disaster, this is going to lead to migration patterns because you're going to have a lot of refugees and IDPs, internally displaced persons. And because of these migration patterns, you're going to have more overpopulation in certain areas of the country. 
with more over overpopulation, you have job shortages, not enough resources, um, increased crime rates, more tensions, and this could lead to a potential conflict. Um, so this is a causal chain that kind of breaks down how natural disasters such as a hurricane or a flood is affecting national security. Another thing that's important to understand is that national security is not just about wars and conflicts, it's also about the economic security of the country. So that's something that's important to understand in these examples. Okay, so now I'm going to expand on the idea of causal chains. Even though the causal chain seems pretty straightforward, you're getting from point A to point B, but making a few stops along the way, it's important to understand that sometimes causal chains turn into circles, right? Like causal chains, but they're actually causal circles. This is because um, things keep affecting each other again and you kind of get a cycle that's not really fun to be in. So I'm going to look at this general example here. You have climate change, extreme weather patterns, global warming, causing lots of increased temperatures, weather disasters, um, things like that. All of this causes famine, um, drought, food and water insecurity, housing crises, health crises because of all the diseases that have been released because of the natural disaster or heat stress, housing crises because of the damage that was caused by the natural disaster, and poverty obviously because of all these different things. Now when you have all of these problems, that brings you to the next point, which is at the bottom, immigration, overpopulation and unemployment. Immigration similar to the point that I was talking about with um, the drought in Syria, because um, you have a, a scarcity of resources such as food and water, you have a destruction of houses and housing crisis, so people need to move usually from the country to the city or vice versa. Um, overpopulation because of these migration patterns that aren't normal and that people aren't used to. And then finally, unemployment because of the overpopulation, because of the infrastructural damage because of the uh, shortage of resources. All of this leads to tension um, between people or between countries and other countries. So domestically, it can cause tension between people because there's increased crime rates, there's conflict, they're protesting for more. Um, people are angry because of all the shortages and lack of governmental support, political tension. And then all of this can escalate and lead to conflict. And the conflict in turn causes more pollution because of um, uh, habitat destruction, infrastructural damage, all of that stuff. And then also economic depression and economic depression as a result of the war, obviously. Um, and then in turn, the economic depression prevents the country from being able to live sustainably and from being able to invest in and climate mitigation efforts and in environmental restoration. And so that also in turn does not allow us to slow down climate change or to prevent global warming. And that's why it's a circle. So the environmental damage led to a political conflict and the political conflict did not allow people to fight those environmental problems or slow them down in the first place. So that's why it's a causal circle. Okay, now I'm going to talk about more specific examples in the Arab world. So as you all probably already know, there's lots of stability in the region, whether it's domestic within each country or international between countries. Um, and there's lots of instability in the Arab world. And this kind of makes it a very good example of environmental security. And it allows us to prove the theory of environmental security correct um, to all those deniers out there. Um, but before I start, there's a few disclaimers that we need to go over. Um, first of all, it's very important to understand that even though we're going to be talking about conflict and things like that, these countries should not be characterized by their conflict, right? It's important to learn about their different cultures and things like that and not just um, characterize them unfairly and believe in unfair stereotypes about the region and that it's a very violent one because it's not. So my first case study is Lebanon, which is where I'm from, and I'm going to go over the causal chain here. So this took place in 2019. Basically in 2019, in October and September, October, November period, we had lots of high temperatures, we had dry winds and we had little rainfall. And I remember very clearly actually 
it took us a long time to get our first rainfall in um, last fall. Um, so as a result of all of this, the, since Lebanon is on the Mediterranean coast and it was very dry and hot, um, the winds weren't moving from the Mediterranean inland. So normally um, the way winter starts is the Mediterranean carries in moist winds, carrying lots of rainfall, but that wasn't taking place. Um, those winds were not very strong and that's why there was no rain. And on top of that, because of human induced climate change and global warming, the weather was very hot. And so the water that was already present and the moisture that was already present in the forests was evaporating. And as a result of that, we had lots of wildfires. Um, and this is the environmental disaster that I'm going to be talking about. So as you can see in the picture, the wildfires burnt down a lot of the forest because Lebanon has a lot of cedar forests. In fact, it takes up 7% of our land. So these cedar forests started burning down. People had to migrate, people had to flee their houses. Um, it was just not a very good time. And the way the wildfires led to a political disaster was this. After the wildfires took place, it took several days for our government to even address the problem. So there was very poor response on the government side. And this attracted a lot of media attention, both from uh, the Lebanese people and from other countries. Like our government was not able, did not have sufficient money or resources to put out the fires. So we had to get help from other countries such as Cyprus or France, and they had to send planes. And this process took many hours and many days, which attracted even more media attention. When this was coupled with other factors, such as the WhatsApp tax that was taking place at the same time, um, uh, the economic crisis that was taking place, the poor behavior of the government and the lack of action, all of this all coupled together led to lots of public outrage and people started getting mad and people started protesting. And this eventually led to the Lebanese revolution, which began on October 17, 2019. Um, so here you can see how people who are skeptical about the concept of environmental security can say, it, so it wasn't really the wildfires that led to the revolution. No, it wasn't. You have to take other factors into consideration as well. So for example, here in the picture, you can see the garbage crisis, which took place in 2015. And I'm sure you saw it on the news or something like that, because the garbage crisis was a really bad one in 2015 with um, garbage literally flowing down the street. And all of this contributed to public outrage and to people just being disappointed with the government and eventually protesting in the streets on October 17th. In turn, the revolution led to even more tension, increased crime rates, political unrest, and eventually the resignation of our prime minister and the government. And because of this governmental collapse, we had hyperinflation, unemployment, increased crime. And in turn, this prevents us from living sustainably, right? Because there's a huge financial crisis in the country. Um, in 2019, one dollar, one US dollar, was the equivalent of 1,500 Lebanese lira. Today, one dollar is the equivalent of 13,900 Lebanese lira, if not more, depending on the rates every day. So here you can see how there's been major inflation with our currency. And this inflation is causing a huge crisis. Um, businesses are shutting down, people are fleeing the country. It's, um, it's not a very good economic situation. And because of the poor economic situation in the country, people are unable to live sustainably. And if people are unable to live sustainably and take care of the environment, this can cause even more environmental problems and the cycle continues. So here you can see that even though I've written this as a causal chain, you can see how each point can actually circle back causing more environmental problems, which will then trickle, trickle down and cause more political problems. And that's why there aren't really causal chains. They're kind of like causal loops, causal cycles, causal circles, whatever you want to call it. Okay. Moving on to our next case study. This one is an expansion of the example I said before, which was the drought in Syria. So first of all, um, you have human induced climate change and global warming. It's very important to understand that the climate does fluctuate. So it's very possible to have one year that's hotter than the other. But in this case, and in most of these cases, actually, the environmental problem stemmed from human induced climate change. So unnatural hot trends and unnaturally hot weather. Uh, and that's the case in Syria in 2006. 
there were warmer and drier conditions in the Mediterranean. And like the case with Lebanon, there was very weak moist winds. Um, the Mediterranean was not carrying in the moisture and the, and the wetness inland. And so there was little rainfall. And because of global warming, there was hotter weather, which was causing more evaporation. So even the moisture and the water that was already present in Syria started evaporating. This led to a very extreme drought between 2006 and 2009. And it was not surprising. Many uh, scientists were using the data that they were getting um, about the Mediterranean and the lack of moist air and the increased evaporation rates. And they predicted that a drought was two to three times more likely. So this drought took place in 2000, between 2006 and 2009 in Syria, as you can see in the top right picture. Um, and as a result of the drought, the Syrian government was unable to place proper uh, water use policies. There was crop failure. Um, the agricultural sector was not doing very well. It was suffering. Um, and there was food and water scarcity because there was no water because of the drought. And there was little food production and lots of food shortages because they were unable to implement irrigation systems. They could not water their plants. And there was just overall crop failure. So as a result of these shortages of food and water, 1.5 million people were forced to migrate from rural to air urban areas, as you can see in the top left picture. Um, and because of these massive migration patterns, um, the urban areas were under lots of stress because you have 1.5 million more people than you normally do. This led to increases in tensions and social stresses, which eventually led to the uprising against President Bashar al-Assad and eventually the Syrian crisis. Um, so here you can see that all of this started with a little drought. The drought led to increased tensions, um, and these tensions just had people on edge and more likely to start an uprising. Um, here you can also see how people who are skeptical about the concept of environmental security can think that the drought didn't really have that much to do with it, or there isn't really enough data to say that the drought was the cause. But we're not saying that the drought was a cause, we're saying that the drought was a contributing factor, which is a very valid point when it comes to environmental security, because you need to take everything into consideration. Like if we look back at the case of Lebanon, I remember last year, uh, sorry, in 2019, many uh, headlines were talking about how the revolution started because of a WhatsApp tax. This is not true. It's so many different factors. It's um, the, it's the, very poor standard of living. It's the inability to trust one's government. It's the lack of access to electricity and water. It's the wildfires as well. So you need to take all these things into consideration. Everything is tied and everything is intersected. And I can actually tie the Syrian uh, case study to the Lebanese one, because after the Syrian crisis, people also had to flee the country because there were lots of refugees and internally displaced persons. and Many of those people actually went to Lebanon because Syria and Lebanon are neighboring countries. Syria is in the north of Lebanon. And before the cri Syrian crisis, Lebanon's population was 4.5 million, give or take a few. But we then got 1.5 million Syrian refugees into the country, which led to the population of Lebanon exceeding 6 million, which is something we're not used to, especially in a country that's super small. And the influx of refugees from Syria also led to increased tensions, increased unemployment, overpopulation in Lebanon. So here, not only are these individual causal chains, but they also intersect at a point. And so you don't really have a causal chain nor a causal circle. You kind of have like a causal web where everything is affecting each other and the environment and national security are intertwined. So I hope that kind of makes sense. So I'm going to move on to our third case study, which is Egypt. Um, okay, so in Egypt, um, the, in Egypt, it's actually very interesting because the concept of environmental security is a very historic one. Um, it was present at the days of the pyramid builders um, and 4,000 years ago. It was, um, it's a very popular uh, intersection in Egypt because they understood this a very long time ago. Um, and at the days of the pyramid builders, they also understood that the amount of water that they had and the access they had to the Nile River could affect their political power and the power they had in the Kingdom of Egypt at the time. 
So, and, and this kind of phenomenon is still taking place today because Egypt is on the bank of the Nile River and their relationship with the river and their access to water supply affects how they do politically and affects the national security situation in Egypt. So similar to the uh, cases in Lebanon and in Syria, we can see that um, the problem starts with global warming and with increasing temperatures. And here again, it's important to understand that many of these increasing temperature trends are not natural and they're human induced because of human induced climate change. So here we have increasing temperatures. In addition to increasing temperatures, we have overpopulation because Egypt has one of the fastest growing populations in the world. Um, and this is obviously not helping their case. Because of overpopulation, they've had to construct a new administrative capital city, which is 28 miles away from the Nile. It's literally in the middle of nowhere. And they're planning on relocating from Cairo to this new city um, gradually, obviously, but they're going to be moving further and further away from the Nile, which is not helping because it means it's harder to get access to water. And they have to transport the water from the Nile all the way out 28 miles out into the desert. In addition to that, um, Ethiopia, which is south of Egypt, is constructing the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. This dam is upstream of Egypt. So it's basically going to be hindering some of the flow of the water um, down the Nile towards Egypt, right? Because Egypt is at the end of the Nile. So the construction of this dam is making it, is going to make it more difficult for Egypt to have access to water because it's going to kind of hinder the flow of water down the Nile. And since Egypt's going to have less access to water, this means it's going to reduce the amount of land that they can plant in by 20%. And this is going to lead to not only a, a water shortage, but also food scarcity, which will lead to the displacement of thousands of workers which is not helpful, especially amidst a very rapidly growing population where people need more and more jobs. So basically here, because there's lots of global warming and um, evaporation of water from the Nile and the construction of the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, um, Egypt is going to suffer from a lot of internally displaced people, even more job shortages than they have. And this is going to cause more social unrest, political tension within the country, or potentially with their neighboring countries, and they could risk having a third revolution, even though they've already had two within the past decade, as you can see in the bottom left picture. So here, the top left picture shows the Nile River. The top right picture shows the new administrative capital city that's still under construction. And you can see how it's in the middle of the desert, meaning access to water is going to be very difficult. In the bottom left picture, you can see the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, which is um, almost done, but pretty much complete. And finally, the protests in the bottom right picture. So here, um, you can kind of find a trend between the cases in Lebanon and Syria and now in Egypt, because all of them kind of stem from global warming and climate change and increased temperatures. And this is a very important point that we need to understand is that um, if these countries are suffering from lots of political unrest, economic crises, they're not, they don't really have the, the resources nor the money to invest in climate mitigation efforts. And that's why it's very important to have two things. First thing is international aid. And second thing is a seat at the table. It's very important to have international aid from countries that are able to fund climate mitigation efforts. And it's very important to have a seat at the table because the voices of these countries need to be heard and need to be taken into consideration when it comes to climate discussions. So a country that's suffering from a major economic crisis, such as Lebanon, cannot be held to the same standard as a country that's doing really well financially, um, because they just don't have the same ability to uh, fund sustainability efforts. So now I'm going to move on to my fourth case study, which is Saudi Arabia. Um, here in Saudi Arabia, as you can see in the pictures, they have lots of air pollution. And according to recent studies, the Gulf states, which include Saudi Arabia, have the most toxic air in the world. And this is due to several reasons. First reason is increased economic activity. Obviously, the oil industry has allowed Saudi Arabia to have a booming economy um, and do really well economically and expand and build. Um, that's one. Two is global warming. 
um, obviously increased temperatures um, cause lots of dust and sand and dryness in the air, which adds to the air pollution that's already there because of the economic activity. And three is the Arab Spring. Um, because uh, of the destruction and the damage um, and like factories and um, green initiatives not working at the rate that they normally do, all of this is contributing to increased air pollution. And so there's lots of dust, lots of sand, lots of chemicals in the air. Because of all this air pollution, um, there's an increased risk of having strokes, um, heart attacks, heart and respiratory diseases, such as cancer or asthma. And all of these workers and citizens are suffering from all of these things, which leads to 14,600 deaths in Saudi per year attributed to air pollution. And this is really unfortunate because these are lives that can be saved. Um, and there's no need for 14,600 people to suffer every single year um, because of air pollution. It's just, it's a major tragedy that's not only not fair, but also causing Saudi a lot of economic losses. Like even though the economy is already doing pretty well, more or less, um, they lose billions of dollars in the workforce because of lack of productivity. And here, this is because um, workers are either dying because of air pollution or they're suffering from those diseases that I mentioned above, or they're just unable to work to their full potential. So if someone has asthma, they're not going to be able to construct as productively or as effectively as someone who works in a country where there's fresh air, there's water, there's moisture in the air and it's not very dry. Um, they're not forced to wear a mask or a buff before working, stuff like that. So here you can see the causal chain and how what started with global warming and increased economic activity is leading to um, economic losses in the country. So these economic losses have the potential to lead to more tensions between people because um, there would be economic problems, job shortages, um, tensions, unemployment, frustrations running high, increased crime rates, and potentially social unrest. So this is another example of how what started as an environmental problem, global warming in this case, can lead to a national security problem, which is tensions and social unrest. So I'm going to move on to our last case study, um, which is Yemen. Obviously, as many of you should know, um, Yemen is suffering from major humanitarian crisis and many people are calling it the world's most urgent one, rightfully so and understandably so. Um, so in Yemen, um, this one is a little bit different because I'm going to be talking about food and not water or air pollution. So in Lebanon, there's a civil war taking place, which has led to lots of poverty, collapsing institutions, and just a, government, uh, a country on the verge of becoming labeled as a failed state, unfortunately. Um, and this situation is causing population displacement, unnatural migration patterns, um, lots of disputes, difficulty of access to resources. And because there is difficulty of access to resources because of the conflict that's taking place, there's an inability to produce food, um, inability, yeah, Yemen actually imports 95% of its food um, because it's unable to, to produce it locally because of the conflict. Um, and because of the damage that's been caused, as you can see in the bottom right slide and the bottom left slide, you can see um, how there is little access to water. Um, and it doesn't help that it's already in a very hot part of the world. And the conflict makes it even more difficult to have access to water supplies. In addition to that, um, the conflict also makes it really difficult for the international community to enter the country to collect and analyze data about food and water, which makes it even more hard to provide aid. So here you have two problems. The first problem is that the conflict is making it difficult for Yemen to produce its own food and it has to import 95% of it. And it makes it difficult for the international aid to collect data to know how much they need to send or things like that. So lots of data is fabricated or not really shared with the public, which prevents international aid from arriving to those who need it most. So here you have food and water scarcity, and finally, the world's most urgent humanitarian crisis. So now that I've discussed those five um, case studies and their causal chains, 
you can take a moment to think about um, how you can apply those causal chains to your own country. Like I'm sure you can think of an environmental problem that led to an issue of national security, whether it's an economic one or a political one. Um, and here you can see that um, environmental security is something that we really need to believe in. Um, as seen in those five countries, it does have um, proof and you can really see how the environment and issues of national security are intertwined. So before I move on to my next point, um, I need to say my few disclaimers. Um, having spoken about those five countries and the Arab region as a whole, it's very important not to take information at surface value and not to believe unfair stereotypes about these countries um, just at first glance. Um, it's very important to educate oneself about the situation in each of these countries to learn about um, their cultures and their histories and to not just believe what the media is portraying unfairly. So that brings me to point number two, which is to question the media. Very often um, portraying Arab regions as very turbulent or as conflict ridden or as very violent suits the narrative of the media, but that's why it's important to question it, which brings me to point number three, which is using reliable sources and listening to info that comes from Arabs themselves or from media that's not necessarily biased or funded by anti-Arab institutions. So for example, here, the picture I've shown is actually taken, that's the view that I can see right here. It's taken from my window. And if you Google Lebanon, you might get pictures of destruction, of conflict, you might get headlines about war, but Lebanon is actually an extremely beautiful country, but the media unfortunately doesn't portray it that way. So this is why it's important to check your sources and to use reliable ones, because the region actually does a lot to fight climate change, which I'm going to get to in a second. And it's a very beautiful one with lots of diverse ecosystems and a very nice climate actually. So and this brings me to point number four, which is to fight stereotypes and not to accept them and to just double check your internalized anti-Arabism or Arabophobia, whichever one you want to use. And finally, educate others about all of these things, about why it's important for Arab countries to have a seat at the table in climate discussions, and also about um, why it's important not to believe the stereotypes that the media shows about these countries. Okay. Having said that and gone that out of the way, I'm going to move on to some good news. Um, okay, so I'm going to move on to some good news. So like I mentioned a few minutes ago, um, the Arab region actually does a lot to combat climate change and to work towards sustainability and achieving the SDGs. So my first example here is the UAE. Um, as you may have heard, Dubai was supposed to host the expo in 2020, but it's been postponed to 2021. So this year in October, Dubai is going to be hosting the Expo, which is a huge convention all about innovation, sustainability, and technology. And here, um, the Expo is focusing a lot on sustainability. All the buildings and all the conventions are going to be following guidelines for sustainable operations. And all the buildings are, have already installed renewable energy systems with a combined energy capacity of 5.5 megawatts or 5.6 if I'm not mistaken on all their building projects. All the buildings also have LEED certifications. LEED stands for Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. Um, and 120 buildings, I think, or 125 are going to have this certification, which is really impressive. And Dubai has also constructed the Sustainability Pavilion which is a section of the expo that's going to have photovoltaic panels all across the roof. In addition to efforts for renewable energy, they're also doing a lot to reduce their um, wasting water. Um, in 2019, Dubai achieved a 52.4% reduction of water demand in all their buildings, which is extremely uh, impressive considering it's in the middle of the desert. Um, and also 90% of the materials that were uh, acquired and produced for the expo are um, uh, in accordance with sustainable materials guidelines. So this is very impressive. Second one is the Morocco solar farm, which is considered the world's largest and most ambitious solar energy plan. 
Um, this is understandable considering it's literally in the desert under the sun, but that doesn't mean it's not impressive. It's a $9 billion investment from the Moroccan Agency for Sustainable Energy. And this solar farm is called the, the Nur Power Station, which I personally really like because Nur in Arabic means light and light represents hope and um, just positive energy for the future. And I really like this project because I think it's not only going to do really well for the planet, but also for the Arab region as a whole, especially Morocco, because solar energy is going to be a major export for them once they complete this farm. It's going to be the world's largest concentrated solar power plant. Um, and this is something that we can really look forward to. My final case, not final, but the final one I'm going to talk about is Green Buildings Initiative, specifically in Qatar. So in the Arab region, lots of uh, countries are working towards making their buildings greener or more sustainable. And this means that they're LEED accredited. Like I said before, LEED is um, Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. It's an organization that um, provides buildings with a green accreditation or certification, meaning that they're in compliance with sustainable standards. Now, Qatar specifically developed their own assessment system for buildings. So in addition to LEED, it's called the Global Sustainability Assessment System. And it's considered the world's most detailed and most comprehensive green building assessment, which is really impressive. And the way they constructed this system was using 40 green building codes from all around the world. So they combined everyone's assessment system and put it into this one big assessment system to be able to see whether their buildings are green or not. And this assessment system takes into consideration many different factors, including energy, water, the location of the building, um, the cost, um, the indoor situation, so like how much air conditioning you need, things, the materials that were used, things like that. And this has a, this project has a lot of potential because they're sharing this system with countries such as Lebanon. Um, and it's not only going to benefit the planet, but it's also going to, in the long term, economically benefit Qatar and all the buildings that are following this system because they will get lots of benefits such as rainwater harvesting, renewable energy, gray water recycling, all of which are economically beneficial in the long run. So that's some good news for you. Now I'm going to talk about my personal experience with environmental security and how I became aware of this phenomenon in my country and in the Arab region. So first of all, I basically fell in love with the ocean when I was like um, 12 or 13 years old. And I remember it was the first time I saw a sea turtle in the wild. Um, I was snorkeling and I just became super obsessed. And I started learning more about plastic pollution, about climate change, about environmental degradation. And I became really aware and really passionate about doing anything in my power that I can do to prevent all of these problems. So here you can see me at my first beach cleanup. And I remember this day, it was just me, my mom, my brother, and my little cousin. And um, I basically dragged them with me to see what's going on at the beach and to have a little beach cleanup. This was at Ramlat al Baida, which is Beirut's biggest public beach. And unfortunately, it's really polluted. Um, and you can see I'm literally holding a toilet seat here. Um, and I just thought that was kind of funny that it's ironic a little bit because it's such a pretty beach. It's literally on the med and there's lots of garbage, unfortunately. So after my first beach cleanup, I was really frustrated at all the garbage that I saw. And so I started growing and growing and growing these beach cleanups, promoting them on social media and getting more people to come with me. And now if you go to Ramnat al Baida, you can see anti-littering signs. You can see that the, the little kiosks and the little stores are not allowed to give out um, plastic straws or plastic bottles or plastic bags. And lots and lots of NGOs are going down every single day to clean up the beach. And it's actually much cleaner now than it was in 2017, I think, which is when this picture was taken. So um, that's more good news for you. Um, and the way this connects to environmental security brings me to the third picture, which is my first panel discussion. Here I was talking in Zgharta, which is a region in Northern Lebanon. And I was invited to speak on this panel um, by my friend who is pictured on the left. She has an NGO um, 
that sells, renew, uh, that sells reusable bags as opposed to plastic disposable ones. And the guy in the middle is the former consultant for the Ministry of Environment in Lebanon. And the three of us were addressing um, an audience of people that don't really know much about climate change or plastic pollution. It was just regular citizens who had just come that day to hear the, the day's talk. And what struck me most and my biggest takeaway from this discussion was how much politics interfere with environmental conservation in Lebanon. Um, people have the tendency to play the blame game or just to deflect blame off of themselves and to try to um, not really take accountability or take responsibility for the damage that they've caused. And this was something that really disappointed me because I thought that if we just put our differences aside and all worked collectively, we could achieve so much more good because um, there's lots of good ideas, especially among the younger generation. And so that was my biggest takeaway from the discussion. And that's when I started getting into the concept of environmental security and of the intersection between politics and the environment and how we can overcome this intersection and overcome our differences in, in, um, uh, for the greater good. And this realization um, made me realize that the sustainability barriers, which are the obstacles that face a person who is trying to live sustainably, the sustainability barriers in turbulent countries are different than those faced in more developed countries. And so I made a survey um, and surveyed young people all across Lebanon, and I asked them what they considered to be the main one, two, or three sustainability barriers that they're facing. So this means, what are the reasons that you're not living sustainably? Uh, and I'm going to go over each one in detail and connect it back to environmental security. So 69% of those young people said that the main reason that they cannot live sustainably is because of lack of resources or inconvenience. And this is actually very understandable. And this is something that I struggled a lot with when I first started being obsessed with the environment and the ocean. Um, if you have a reusable water bottle, right? You made the choice. You don't want to use a plastic water bottle anymore. You have your refillable water bottle. You go to a public place. There's no water dispenser. Or you go and buy something at the store and you're willing to pay the extra 50 cents to get a reusable bag, but they don't offer it. Um, you want to go vegan or you want to go vegetarian. The government is not investing in um, products such as tofu that you can eat as a vegan or a vegetarian, right? So you go to the supermarket and there's nothing there. You, you just, you can't live a healthy lifestyle because you don't have a wide variety of options. So you're, you're not motivated to do that anymore. And this, is, this stems from financial difficulties because the country is going through an economic crisis, because we have so many other things to fund such as restoration programs. Um, it's just, sustainability is not considered a priority, which is unfortunate and which should not be the case. The second problem that people considered the most urgent was the mentality. And this is because um, like you look around and like I mentioned in the panel discussion in Zgharta, many people didn't even know what climate change was, right? They weren't aware of the problems. They don't really care. And that's because there's a lack of awareness and also because they have so many other problems. So if someone is struggling to provide for their family, they're not really going to make the effort to invest in a refillable water bottle instead of just drinking from plastic bottles that they can find, right? It's, the mentality is just not ready for such a major shift. Which brings me to the third point, which is financial difficulties. This comes from conflict, lack of governmental support, um, not subsidizing green initiatives or NGOs that are working towards sustainability and also lots of conflict. Then the fourth point is a difficulty breaking old habits and a lack of institutional support. This is similar to the first point uh, about inconvenience. So if I want to recycle and I'm pretty committed to recycling, at school, we don't have a recycling program. So how is that my fault? Like, what can I do? Um, and I'm going to get to what you can do in a bit, but I'm just explaining what goes through each person's mind when they encounter one of these sustainability barriers. And finally, lack of awareness. It's very difficult to be the only person who's doing something when everyone else is against it. Um, and lack of awareness stems from lots of conflict, 
people have other things on their mind, they have lots of financial difficulties and they don't really have the patience nor the resources to make the effort to live sustainably. So this is why in a turbulent country where you have problems of national security, such as a civil war, a revolution, a conflict, a humanitarian crisis, uh, an economic crisis, it's very difficult to live sustainably because the barriers that you encounter are multiplied and are increased. Whereas in a developing country, more or less, you do have governmental support, um, you do have financial support, um, public or governmental institutions are equipped to allow you to live a sustainable lifestyle. Whereas in more turbulent countries or developing countries, that's not the case. So how can we overcome these sustainability barriers in turbulent countries and why is it so important? So first of all, the reason it's so important is like I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation, these countries deserve and need a seat at the table when it comes to climate discussions. 22% of the world's population, which is 1.3 billion people, live in poverty. And these people, because they're living in poverty, cannot really fend for themselves when it comes to sustainability. They're depending on, developing country, uh, on developed countries to make a bigger effort to combat climate change because they're not really in a position where they can fight the 2030 deadline that the UN has placed, right? Um, if they're not living in poverty, they're going through conflict or both since they, they're, they go together. So 40 plus countries are going through ongoing wars or conflicts. And this is obviously preventing them from investing in sustainability, from investing in achieving the sustainable development goals, um, and from investing in reducing their climate emission, their carbon emissions by 2030 or 2025, if you want to be more urgent. Um, which brings me to the point of environmental security. This is why it's super important to believe in environmental security because so many of those countries are not able to fend for themselves when it comes to sustainability. And that's why it's important to recognize the intersection between the environment and those conflicts that they're going through and help them either by providing international aid or by making a bigger effort by yourself, right? So that's why it's very important to recognize that you can't generalize um, sustainability requirements across all countries. So like if the US is expected to reduce their climate emissions by a certain amount, um, Yemen cannot do the same, right? If, um, I don't know, Sweden is supposed to reduce their carbon emissions by this much, um, Lebanon cannot do the same. It's just, they don't have the same resources. Um, they don't have the same uh, state of national security to be able to invest the same way. So that's why it's very important to recognize the intersection between national security and the environment. So now I'm going to go into how we can overcome the barriers in those turbulent countries. And I'm going to add a little bit of my personal experiences um, doing so. So the first point was lack of resources and inconvenience. And the way I personally overcame this was through advocacy, patience, and creativity. So at school, um, if we didn't have access to a recycling program, or if I wanted to um, just refill my refillable water bottle, we didn't have water dispensers. Um, I tried to fix those problems by raising awareness, by getting people on my side, um, by running for a student council, by forming a sustainability committee. Um, and if, we're during um, the pandemic now, but before we set up a recycling program at my school and hopefully when the pandemic's over and everyone's back on campus, we can uh, see this in action. I'm going to be graduating, but hopefully uh, I'll visit campus one day and see the recycling program that I helped set up because it's something that we are really proud of. Um, and it's something that was difficult to do because the school is not, um, not in a position financially where they can invest in a recycling program because in Lebanon, you have to go for a private company um, to recycle for you. So um, we had to find different companies and we actually ended up with four different companies, each one collecting a different type of garbage. So one for paper, one for plastic, one for glass, because we found that this was the cheapest and the most efficient financially. So here you can see how we overcame the lack of resources and the inconvenience um, through advocacy, patience, and also thinking creatively and thinking outside the box. 
In terms of the mentality, it's very important to raise awareness. And I have a funny story about this. Um, because in the region, or in my country at least, people aren't really aware of the problems and of climate change, and they don't know what it is. So I have a friend of mine um, who wasn't aware, and we spent an entire car ride of me just explaining what's climate change, and the world is burning up, and um, you, we need to stop this, and we need to stop that. And then the next day, he changed his profile picture on WhatsApp to the picture of the Earth in solidarity with Mother Earth, um, having recognized that um, this is an urgent problem and it's something that we need to make a bigger effort to tackle. And so here you can see that raising awareness actually really affected this person um, because it's very important to do so and it's very important to educate others if the school system or if the media is not doing that themselves. So next for financial difficulties, like I said before, um, people consider this a major sustainability barrier in Lebanon, especially now with hyperinflation and the economic crisis. They just, they don't want to spend their money on things that they don't deem a priority. Um, and the way you can overcome this is through minimalism. And I found this to be um, very effective. People think that if they want to live sustainably, they have to invest. But instead, sometimes it's even more cost efficient for them to reduce or to live minimalistically um, and to not spend as much as they used to before. So sometimes if you're not able to make the substitution, so like from eating meat to going vegetarian, you can just reduce your meat consumption, which is also cheaper. So this is how um, reduction is more cost efficient and benefits the environment. In terms of lack of support and difficulty breaking old habits and lack of institutional support, Again, collaboration is very important. So if you want to go vegetarian, it's very important to find someone to do that with you, right? Because if you're the only person in your house who's um, going vegan or going vegetarian, it's difficult, it's demotivating, and it's, it's difficult because you're going to have to have a different meal than everyone else, especially in our country where we like to have family meals because um, uh, we like to have huge family meals. That's just how we do it as Arabs. So uh, you don't want to be the only person who's not eating tawu or, or kafta or something like that. Um, really yummy, by the way, but not good for the environment. Um, so here, collaboration and finding someone to do these things with is really important, as well as advocacy. So like I said, if your institution in the workplace or at school is not providing you with the infrastructural support that you need to live a sustainable lifestyle, you can always advocate for it, run for class rep, um, uh, sign petitions and create petitions and do all these different things that will enable you to get the institutional support that you need. Finally, that brings me to lack of awareness, which I already talked about with the mentality point. Um, obviously, the way you combat lack of awareness is by raising awareness. And it's not just about posting on social media. You can do it in a better and more effective way, such as through your school. Like for me, um, when we set up the sustainability program last year, we said that starting this 20, fall 2021, so the academic year that's coming up, um, we're going to integrate uh, the SDGs into the curriculum. So like every term is going to highlight one of the SDGs and that's going to be integrated into all their subjects. So like if you're taking biology, you're going to focus on that specific SDG in your lesson. If you're taking math, the word problems that you're solving are going to be like SDG themed. So this is something that we're working on and something that we're still setting up, but it's something that's going to really educate the younger generation on the SDGs and why it's important to achieve them, because it's going to be integrated into their everyday curriculum. Okay, so I always like to end every presentation um, on a positive note, because sometimes it can be easy to be a Debbie Downer or a doomsdayer and to suffer from eco grief, but it's very important to also remain hopeful at the same time. And my favorite kind of organized hope is Dr. Jane Goodall's Five Reasons for Hope. Um, love her. Uh, so her five reasons are social media. Like I said before, um, advocacy and raising awareness on social media is a great way to educate people and also to get them on your side. Like the way I grew my beach cleanups from just uh, my mom and I to everyone else and getting big groups and getting people I wasn't even very close to, like strangers, 
um, was through social media and posting about it. The second reason for hope is human intellect. Like you can see with the examples with um, Qatar's green building system, the expo taking place in Dubai, Morocco's solar farm. Um, we, we really have the resources and we have the technology and we have the brains to come up with um, ways to live sustainably, even in turbulent countries. And that's why human intellect and technology and science is all super important and very inspiring. Like we all know that we saw this with the pandemic, right? They used an algorithm to come up with a vaccine. And now in the future, um, if there's another vaccine, they can just input the information about the virus into the algorithm and get a vaccine within days, which is something that's really impressive and really inspiring because think about the implications that this can have for climate mitigation. Um, next, we have the resilience of nature. And this is something that I saw in my country and abroad. Um, if you watched Our Planet by um, uh, BBC, narrated by Sir David Attenborough, also love him. Um, he talks about how the animals are coming back to Chernobyl. So even if we damage the environment, eventually nature will come back if we allow it to breathe just a little bit. And this is something that I saw in Lebanon as well. Like when we stopped polluting Ramil Tilbaida, you can start seeing um, fish returning a little bit, water quality improving, and nature just prevailing at the end of the day. Um, then number four is the youth. Obviously, this is something that we're very strong believers in um, on the World Oceans Day Youth Advisory Council. And you can see in the live stream how everyone here is so passionate about ocean conservation and climate mitigation. And everyone is so full of fresh ideas um, and more importantly, the will to, to do better. Which brings me to my last point, which is the indomitable human spirit. And um, this is my favorite point, honestly, because it just shows that we're not going to back down as a, as a species. Um, and you can see this, especially during the pandemic, we saw so many people who were just doing good and being good and doing better, um, helping each other and just being there for each other. And this is something that's going to take place more and more as the climate situation gets worse because we need to stand together and we need to overcome petty conflicts and instead prioritize the greater good and the future of our planet. And so that's why Dr. Jane Goodall has five reasons um, to have hope for our planet and to believe that we will overcome this environmental crisis and do better. And I agree with her honesty because um, I've worked with so many young people both through World Oceans Day and in my home country. And I've seen that the youth really can bring better whether it's through ideas or whether it's simply through passion. And that's why I have hope um, as well. Which brings me to my conclusion. So first of all, um, we learned that environmental and national security are linked and they're intersected and nothing is just cause and effect. It's always a causal chain or a circle or a web and everything is interconnected. Um, and the environment does in fact affect issues of national security, whether it's political or economic and vice versa, such as with um, the avalanches in World War I and Agent Orange. Point number two is that causal chains can be circles. They can be circles, they can be loops, they can be cycles, I don't know, um, but they can definitely be circles. Point number three is that the Arab world is progressing and deserves a seat at the table when it comes to climate discussions. Um, point number four is that you can make change too, um, such as, um, what I did at my school and everyone is doing through World Oceans Day. It's never too late and it's never too hard. Everything is possible as cheesy as it sounds. Like you can always think outside the box. You can always just keep pursuing something you want. And finally, we do need to have hope. And I hope that everything taking place this World Ocean Day and um, everyone's presentations during the Youthathon inspire you to have hope and also inspire you to take action yourself because we can do it. So thank you. And I guess I'm done. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, and also I'm agree with you. Uh, everyone, can, everyone can make a difference and become a change maker. And also that was a really interesting and powerful topic. Uh, and in addition, you gave us a really different perspective. 
Uh, and also uh, in the middle of your session, you gave us so many good news that we still can have hope. And also you actually made my day with that uh, good news. Thank you so much. And do we have any questions? Thank you, Arya. If anyone has any questions, you can ask them in the chat. But I think everyone, uh, everything is so clear. Um, yeah, I had so many questions in the beginning of your session, but now I'm all clear. Thank you, thank you. Let me check. Yeah, everything is so clear. So thank you so much. Uh, it was great to having you here and uh, listening to a really interesting topic. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you guys for joining.